how is your mental health now? You know, you had this concern about surveillance and vigilance and people staring at you, and then you decide to spend an entire career having people watch you. Yeah. But you're also 30, so there's this sense of self-expectation. I'm supposed to have my life together by now. I, surely I should be an adult by the time that I'm 30 years old. What's your relationship with your mental health like now? Very good. Like when it comes to stuff like that and like how I, with, with, with the stuff that I do, like I don't, I, I, it's crazy how I, I'm like, I don't give a shit. Like with the, with the obese video, my grandma's like, you went into the mall like that? I'm like, yeah. And she's like, you couldn't pay me to do that. So I feel like I'm very like, I, I'm willing to do anything. And I, I kind of don't really care anymore. And a lot of people ask me like, how did that change for you? And it's just, I, I don't even have an answer for it. And I think YouTube and doing this and having people like follow me and support me has allowed me to feel okay with who I truly should be and who I've always wanted to be. Um, the biggest thing I struggle with now is I have insane imposter syndrome, insane. Mm. Like even me being on this podcast right now, like on the way here, I was like, why? And that's something I've always had about myself. I'm just always a person who I can never appreciate anything that I've done. I can never feel like I'm worthy of anything and I feel like I don't deserve it. And I feel like it's gonna get taken away from me. Mm. And um, I've always felt like that, even like trying out for hockey teams. It's just like, I shouldn't be here. And that, that I, don't know, I, don't, I don't think that's ever gonna be something that goes away from me. When you talk about imposter syndrome, how does that, because it seems like there's two things going on. One is the inability to congratulate yourself on a job well done, yep. but the other is a feeling of not being worthy of the opportunities or the rooms that you get yourself into. Is it both of those things? Both of those things, are heavily. They, do heavily. they happen kind of separately or are they just kind of congealed into one? Congealed into one for me. Right, okay. Yeah, so, like, very, very much so, like very intense for me. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Like I, I have a hard time, like even like meet and greets. I'm always like, wow, like people are going to line up to meet me. I mm -hmm. don't understand why. And I, I don't even know how to explain it. But given that you enjoy your content so much and given that uh, you have limited self-awareness, uh, concerned self-consciousness, why do you think that this thing still lingers? It feels like you've conquered a lot of the, challenges mentally that you had when you were a bit younger, but there's this one vestige, you know, bad monster lurking under the bed that's still there. Why, why do you think this one's still there? I, that's something I got to unpack. I really don't know. It's um, the biggest regrets in my life are because of it, where I was, a, again, I, I was a high level hockey player and I, I didn't go and pursue certain things because I feel like I didn't, I wasn't worthy of it. I didn't deserve it and I couldn't do it. And I feel like I just shouldn't have been there because I felt like other people deserved it more and were better than me. And um, that has very much stick with me. And I, I don't know why. Mm. And it's something that I hate. Mm. So the inability to congr congratulate yourself on a job well done, I'm intimately familiar with. The imposter syndrome thing has actually largely dissipated over the last 18 months for me, something that I was intimately familiar with, but I don't, I don't really feel anymore. And I don't know, not really too sure where that came from. I think uh, the live tour that I did last year helped quite a bit with that because there was nowhere to hide. So it was me on stage for 90 minutes. With There wasn't even slides. It's just me talking to a room. Um, and I think that was just such a, like Navy SEAL hell week of inescapable, if you mess up, it's on you. If you do well, it's on you thing. Um, I think that was kind of a formative experience. And then certainly being in the room, so to speak, of the guests and then their, you know, sort of very nice comments. And then doing Rogan uh, twice helped a lot with that. Um, had it have gone badly, I don't know how I would have felt. Maybe it would have, maybe I would have like, that would have proven to me that I didn't deserve to be in the room that I knew all along. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's also a little bit here where you think, well, hang on, should your imposter syndrome really be fixed by other people's, even, uh, your own judgments on your performance? Should it not come from some 
in a place where I just believed in me and so on. But I don't know. I get the sense that we all want validation and we want to be respected by people that we respect. So trying to have some ascetic man in a cave just sort of meditating his way through, I don't need worldly possessions and I don't need to be told by the world that I've done a good job and so on and so forth. I think that's just unrealistic for most people's psychology. Uh, it, maybe it would be the best way and you know, it's the gold standard where you just do it and you don't give a fuck what anybody else mm -hmm. thinks. It, I don't think that's realistic for most people. It very much could be an unaware defense mechanism for myself where, you know, just in case something mm, ever happens, it's, a protection. it's kind of like, I, I expect it to happen or something like that. Like even like a lot Always of my- Always got that door open. Yeah. Like even my achievements, like through all this thing, like it's like I've, I've achieved things that I've never thought I could in my life um, because I thought so like poorly of myself. And when I hit them, my dad's like, dude, like, oh my God, congratulations. And I'm just like, thanks. Like, yeah, I never like take a moment to be like, like to appreciate the wins. And I think it's just maybe me just being like, I don't know. I don't know when this is going to end for me kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I was writing the other day. I haven't got round to uh, finishing it off yet. I think you and me are in slightly different ways, pretty good role models for people that don't believe that they can do a thing, but they end up doing it anyway. Like I didn't have a massive amount of faith. I just sort of enjoyed the thing. And then before you know it, you've got some degree of success that the world sort of bestows on you. But presuming that you need to be able to believe that you can do it before you do it is like such a fallacy to me. Like, yes, would it be great? Would it be even the gold standard for you to just believe it and then see it and then go and do it? Yeah, fantastic. But so few people, if you're going to be waiting until you believe that you can do it, you're going to be waiting forever. For some people with some sort of pathologies and lacks of self-belief. Uh, so yeah, I kind of like the idea of being a, a good example of someone that never really had faith that it that anything was going to work and just kind of experimented and fucked around and yeah, then I, found out. I think a, a benefit to me, I don't know about you, but I think a lot of people who maybe you probably talk to who end up being YouTubers and stuff for a living, this is what they wanted to do. And it was either like, this is the route I'm going to take and there's no other option. For me, this is not even like on my radar. I wanted, I wanted to be a chef. I was going to go to culinary school. In a fat kid. And, yeah, chef in a fat kid. Yeah. But I was going to go to culinary school and um, Again, my passion from just making projects at school is making videos. And I didn't have, once I finished school, I didn't have an outlet to make videos for anything. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to like make, I literally made videos myself on my own time with no intention for anybody to, anybody to watch them. Hmm. And I didn't even know anything about YouTube, didn't know it was really monetizable. I just started putting them out there. Are they still out there? They're not. God damn it. No. Yeah. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Thank God. Yeah. But I, I just started putting them out there. And, it was just, the, I think it was a thing of like, there wasn't a direction I was going with it. I had no expectation for myself. I was like purely just doing it you enjoyed for it. fun. So I enjoyed it. And then I started in June, 2019. And then by January one, I had a hundred thousand subscribers and it kind of just all happened like so fast. So I, I don't think I, I necessarily even like ever had a chance to even like doubt myself, mm. like until I got to a point where I'm like, I guess I'm not going to culinary school. I'm doing this. You've already reached escape velocity. Yeah. Yeah. I, and again, the difficulty and motivation for stuff like that is that you've set up a success fail binary based on the outcome of the thing that you're doing, as opposed to you were making videos before anybody watched them. Mm. I would happily have these conversations if no one was. Uh, so there is no, all of the judgment of success and failure kind of doesn't really matter, yeah. which makes you largely immune to it mm. uh, in some ways. And uh, yeah, it is a kind of a superpower to do something that you would do if no one else knew that you were doing it. And that's why it's very hard for me to see my progress because I very much still see myself, which I think I should, as the the guy, the kid who like started on his iPhone making videos. So I don't really recognize a lot of like my progress, which I also think I should be recognizing it, but I just think it's, it's all kind of happened so, so fluidly mm. that I, I'm still very much in that mindset. Do you associate 
sacrifice and pain and discomfort with a good job being done? Do you sort of draw that line between the two? That if something happens that's good or successful, but that it doesn't come with an associated bucket of pain, that it wasn't as worthwhile? Yes. Right. So that's yeah. a, a huge pattern that I had and still have. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's one of the one of the odd patterns that you build, especially if you grind away for a very long time doing something before you get any public recognition for it, is that you almost learn to love the discomfort. And then you have this weird version of kind of like survivor guilt, where if something good happens, but you haven't had the discomfort that you had in the beginning, that you think it, it's undeserved or it shouldn't have come along that way. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a very strange, like reverse blessing, a curse that you've kind of given yourself. You build this habit in the beginning that you can't dispense with, even though you no longer need it yeah. anymore. You don't need to be like whipping yourself through this thing. And it, and it still sticks with me. Like in to a certain degree, I'm like, I'm a big, like for some like kind of sick reason, I'm like, the more that I am on the brink of dying, in some way in a video, it's going to do better. So I'm like, my blood oxygen is 80. Perfect. What about 79? What about I'd, 78? I'd be like, better. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'd be like, even better. And like, that's a horrible mentality. It's a to dangerous have. dynamic doing what you do. Yeah. And then on the other side, if it's like, if a video was too easy, I get anxious. I'm like, yo, this was, this is, this can't do well. It was too simple. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm sitting with my, like, my buddy who works with me and I'm always asking for reassurance. I'm like, is this okay? Is this okay? Like, is, is, this is going way too smooth. Like, it can't be like this. 